speak now. Hello, welcome, and thank you everyone for joining our webinar title From the Outside Looking In This Evening. I am Norisa, your host. Now, before we begin, I would like to just share a little reminder for all our viewers on FB Live right now. If you have any question for Mr. Hafeni, please do not hesitate to leave your question in the FB chat box at any time of the talk. And your question will be relayed back to our team in the Google Meet session. There's a slight delay between Google Meet session and FB Live session. So everyone is advised to send their question early so we will be able to get that. And for all the participants in the Google Meet, Google Meet session, I will like to just remind you to put your headphones and make sure all the mic turns off and not in use. This is to ensure that our webinar session today runs smoothly without any high cups. Now, I would like to invite Mr. Ahmed to recite Al-Fatiha for Dr. Azrul that had passed, for, passed away last week and do offer our humble event. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Ar-Rahman ar-Rahim malik yawm al-deen. Iyaka na'budu wa iyaka nasta'een. Ihidina as-sirat al-mustaqeem. Sirat al-lazina na'amta alayhim. Ghayri al-mawdu'i. Amin. Amin. Allahumma laka alhamdu wa laka shukr ala kulli ma qaddarta wa qadayt. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala alihi wa ashabihi wa sallim. Allahumma arham Dr. Azrul wa abdilhu daran khayran min darih. Wa taqabbalhu ya arham al-rahimin ya Rabb al-alamin ya Allah. Wa arhamhu wa aghfir lahu ya Rabb. واغسل ذنوبه كما تغسل الذنوب يا رب العالمين يا الله ومن يغفر الذنوب إلا أنت يا رب العالمين يا الله اللهم اقسم لنا من خشيتك ما تحول به بيننا وبين معصيتك ومن طاعتك ما تبلغنا بها جنتك ومن اليقين ما تهون به علينا مصائب الدنيا يا رب العالمين اللهم اغفر لنا وارحمنا وعافينا واعف عنا وارزقنا واجعل حياتنا سهلة يا رحم الراحمين وصل اللهم على محمد وعلى آله وسلم آمين والحمد لله رب العالمين. Thank you, Mr. Ahmed, for the wonderful du'a. May Allah bless our pursuit of knowledge this evening. Next, we would like to invite our lecturer, Dr. Razif, to give a welcoming speech for all participants, and especially our guest, Mr. Hafendi. Thank you, Lisa. Shukur alhamdulillah. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. And good morning, uh, good evening. First of all, I, uh, it is my pleasure to welcome everyone to our fourth AD graduate seminar series. I would like to welcome our guest speaker all the way from UK, Mr. Effendi Anwar. Thank you so much for your time to share your knowledge and experience with us today. For your information, every semester we will organize this program, but due to uh, CMO, uh, we have to adjust to the new norms. It is hoped that this program <coughs> would act as a platform for collecting the latest knowledge and information. Finally, I would like to thank uh, the organizing committee and everyone who has contributed to all aspects of this uh, webinar series. Uh, may this webinar session will be a fruitful uh, discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Razi, for that wonderful speech. All right, everyone. It's a quite special day today. As Dr. Razi mentioned just now, we have a special guest that we will join us all the way from UK, Mr. Heavenly Anwar. Heavenly is a renowned young artist and there is, no, there is no strange to the art world. Having had many exhibitions throughout his career, spanning towards many different countries, Heavenly's idea and subject in his body of work has oftentimes still managed to transmit a sense of awe to his own upbringing and identity, even when speaking to an audience that might be foreign to, the, to these ideas. The same upbringing and identities cannot be separated from our home country, Malaysia. However, it almost seems like a transit beyond the cultural scope when it comes to heaven. Well, let us find from the man him, find out from the man himself. How are you, Mr. Heavenly? Uh, yeah, thank you. I'm, I'm good. Thanks. It's great to hear that you're doing all right. And we'd like to thank you again for spending some time with us this evening. Oh, no. My pleasure. Thank you for inviting. All right. So... To kickstart this session, could you give us a comprehensive introduction to yourself? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, I am currently based in um, Oxford in the UK. Um, 
I was born in Seremban um, and then moved to KL when I was one um, and then been studying in KL and lived abroad for a bit and I did my art education um, in the US and in the UK um, and I worked um, um, in sort of many different media, um, multidisciplinary sort of approach um, and recently I've been looking at the Kain Plika or Sarong as like a as a subject matter to orientate my practice. All right, so mm -hmm. I've been informed that you have a few slides for us. Maybe you could share it with, uh, with our viewers that might be not familiar with. Yeah, sure, sure. I can I can share the slides. Yeah, I think I put a bit too many slides, but I can go through quite fast as well. Yeah. <clears throat> um, okay. Should I start now? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, okay. Um, Assalamu alaikum. Um, so I'm just gonna go through like a few images of my work um, from the past few years, starting with um, sort of an image of an open kind of like Um I think I was sort of interested when I was in Oxford at the Ruskin when I was doing my MFA. Um, I realized I was sort of always sort of interested in everyday items and um, especially everyday items that have this sort of visual or formal um, connotation to like minimalist objects or the grid um, or yeah or geometric abstraction and um, so when I opened up the kind of I took a photo of it uh, on the wall um, it kind of shows me this sort of like a plane that is a grid where I thought I could position things and rearrange things and values and stuff um, I, uh, I can start with an image from a book um, Old Kuala Lumpur by J.M. Gullick um, it's a 1995 book published by Oxford Uni. I actually, it was the only book that I really enjoyed when I was at uh, Oxford. So I finished it in one sitting at the Sackler Library. Um, it was like, I mean, for me, the most enjoyable book I read. And it was, it was nice to see an image because of KL, especially at this time. And this was at the race course during sort of the colonial period or post, slight post-colonial period. Um, and People, you can see sort of wealth um, with sort of at the racehorse and there's sort of different strata of society and also people sort of wearing kind pleka in the front and the way they're sort of lined up in a way reminds me of the foreshadowing the city skylines of KL, you know, or sort of like the facades of windows and, um, but yeah, no, so I was interested in this and, and then KL has always served like an important um, inspiration for my work. Um, this is my work that I showed at Ilham in a really good exhibition, Ilham Contemporary Forum. Um, and I was, I was sort of, yeah, so KL and its urban fabric has always sort of inspired my work. And I've always find, tried ways to find and anchor my, my visual work of visual interest into like sort of social realms. Um, and this is a picture of this a studio, the windows outside the studio in my first studio, actually in Ampang, um, where I live in KL and I really miss. Um, but this, uh, and so architecture has played an, a very, I mean, architecture and its relationship to sculpture has played um, a very strong, important role in my practice. Um, this is a commission that I did. Um, um, so I was looking at how also modern architecture, like sort of the idea of sort of modernism and like the Pelotis and its relationship, relationship to, to the Malaysian architecture, indigenous architecture, like the silts, stilts in Malay houses, you know, the one that, so there's this relationship of, of sort of Western and Asian that throughout history that I'm interested in. Um, this was a digital collage where I did, when I did a residency in Tehran, um, in Iran. Um, so I would just walk around the city and sort of photograph all these amazing um, doors because in Tehran, so the doors are very elaborate, kind of like in Malaysia where people have like those Roman columns on their houses. But in Tehran, they have these amazing like Art Nouveau, like, like minimalist and like sort of like really kind of decorative um, gates and doors. And I like the idea of sort of back doors as well. Um, of these alleyways um, um, that are hidden. Um, 
these are my sculptures that I think I've shown them many times or Pelotis. Um, again, they're inspired by city life in Malaysia. The bowls and cups are sort of the ones that you find at sort of hawker stalls, like Chinese hawker stall or Indian hawker stall. They're like melamine plastic tableware. I sort of stack them up. Um, and I like the idea of them kind of being really childlike, like how children would sort of stack things up and see how far, how far they can stack them. Um, and yeah, and then and they're also like influenced by like modernist sculpture, like Bencuzis and stuff, like his endless column, especially. Um, there's just an image of my father and me. Um, and so my work at the Ruskin was sort of oriented in that in, in relationship to the Kayan and and I, I like the idea that like the Kayan as well it's it's omnipresent throughout Malaysian history but it's also like like there's no sort of historical basis like it, it, it's almost like a a form that exists throughout time it doesn't change um, um, this is a illustrated um, guide to the Malaya pavilion um, I was interested in the image and the carefree life that the idea of the care and a lot of artists nowadays still sort of paint this sort of image of the um, the far away and I, I was sort of I like the idea that I'm interested in both the tension of like the city life where I live in KL but also um, this sort of like nostalgia of like the other like far away like beach beaches and coconut trees and stuff um, so some of the works I did was sort of um, because I was so far away in Oxford and in KL, um, the only, one of the ways that I could do was sort of visual research. I would scour like the archives at the Pitt Rivers Museum. Um, I had my brother help me scan some photographs from my family archives. And also I was um, going through sort of Instagram, looking at hashtags of time play cut or s stuff like that and collecting like hundreds of images. And then I would sort of keep them and then they kind of become like filters of how I sort of see Malaysia and how it changes throughout time. So some of the images were taken by sort of colonial photographers, like by British colonial photographers during that time, like a long time ago, and also sort of contemporary life of just kids hanging out in like mama stalls where you can flick up. And I was, and they have this, I like that sort of ahistorical in a way, or there's no, there's not, there's no sense of weirdly time. Um, this is um, one of the work. Um, they're just sort of painted photograph and they're meant to be sort of prompts for sculptures. Um, this is another one. Um, this is um, actually a still from Bujalapo. And I was sort of, I rewatched the film like a few times when I was in um, Oxford. And I like the, how the fabric became like these other prota protagonists um, that, Hello, <laughs> um, that exists um, in the background. Um, they're sort of, um, yeah, they're kind of very theatrical and yeah, they, um, this is um, one of the image. Um, so I'm just showing sort of images that have inspired my sort of recent work and how I position and contextualize my work within this sort of social historical context of Malaysia. Um, I mean, this is a work by Ibrahim Hussein, um, my father, the astronaut. Again, um, on the astronaut, so the helmet, you can see that the other, the nostalgia of like the coconut trees. And I like that sort of relationship of the kind of like and this idea of sort of carefreeness and the coconut trees. Even though for me, I was, yeah, so um, this is a work called Pankor that I did. Um, um, I wanted to sort of, after a while of working with this fabric, I wanted to, for them to also exist, like in, like almost like a character or protagonist, like the Piramli film. So I added sort of legs to them. Um, um, yeah, and they sort of, like they, they could sort of stand on their own. Um, this is an image of sort of, I remember it sort of being back home and seeing in my cousin's places where they would have their babies sort of hanging in this like buayan and I was sort of interested in how the hammock as well. So the idea of the hammock, which is sort of evident in most of the global south, uh, people would just sleep in hammocks and how the hammocks in a way becomes an active sort of um, 
or an active stance against sort of like the idea of work or capitalism and by doing nothing it's also being sort of actively saying something um and and i did my first sort of hammock study at, at oxford and the human body is sort of um, replaced with a gutter tube or they call it like toilet tube where you know your sort of excrement will go through the toilet they're usually brown in color um but they sort of replace the human body and and this is sort of more, one of my more recent work that i currently showing in singapore um of sort of these cradles or hammocks and yeah and i, I guess that's it for my presentation <laughs> yeah <clears throat> thank you all right um thank you so much mr happily for that comprehensive introduction it is yeah. amazing how much you can achieve at such young age it is also amazing to see what such progress what such a progressive creative mind can achieve before that once again thank i would you. like to remind our viewer if you if you have any question at any moment during the talk just leave them on the chat box and i will bring them up later <clears throat> now mr happily i have some question that i like to ask regarding your practice um, so, should i should I get out of my slides? Sorry. Um, oh, you you could just leave it there. Yeah, yeah. because I have a question um, regarding the slide. Yeah. Okay. So the first question. Oh, you I have. Oh, sorry. I, okay. It's okay. <laughs> All right. So the first question I was about to ask about the kind polygat, but you already explained about the kind polygat. So. Other than the kind of link that you seem to dabble with many different materials, for example, ceramic. So the first part of the question is, what other materials have you dabbled with and why? Secondly, do these materials inform your practice or is it solely a way to experiment? Um, yeah, I mean, I think initially when I first started, I was thinking about it definitely materially um, in terms of sort of the kind of link and also its relationship to sort of other materials like and it's sort of physical properties like its weight and there's one work where i wrapped it when i was sort of playing around the studio i wrapped it around an aluminum sheets and thinking about these sort of off-cut aluminum sheets that i bought off ebay and having sort of different weight but what does that weight say about it um it was yeah i mean and also like shells as well these sort of cast um shells um but i don't know it's the it's really hard to think about putting like thinking about the kind plica on its own but in relationship to other materials because there's it the kind plica is also like a weird material like it's it's cultural but it's also like mass produced like it's really sort of consumer so it has no i i mean it's also has no significant Malaysian identity, like it's also South South Asian, and and so by bringing in other materials, I can sort of tie them back to Malaysian identity in a way, um, or not. But yeah, I don't know. I, I don't know if the answer helps with your question. <laughs> it is helping. Okay, so following <laughs> to that, in terms of your practice, where do you start when dealing with a new idea? Is it a line of progression, or can it start from any point? Ah, um, yeah. I mean. It's really hard. I think new works, there's two ways I think I approach to making new work. One would be there's an idea that I thought, ah, oh, maybe it's kind of interesting. Um, and then and then I would sort of play around with the idea in my head. And but the other one would be a sort of continual sort of exploration of that idea over time, where I would test it in sort of different scales and different sort of materials and different sort of contexts of exhibition as well. And I think the work keeps on sort of always changing whenever, even though you're finished with it, the meaning and sort of the, the work changes in different contexts where you put it. So it's never really static as well. And the work is sort of different, the different venues or location or historical context they exhibit it. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I see. So are there any particular attachment to cultural belief and values to your body of work? or are they more personal view of your experiences? Yeah, that's really, I mean, it's really tricky. I think, um, yeah, I, well, they're kind of sort of personal interpretation. I would not try and say that my point of view 
rep is representative of a general sort of perspective. Um, I think, uh, yeah, it's, sorry, where, um, it's, yeah, so it's, it's, I think it's more of a personal view of what I think. And I do have sort of, sort of views of how um, art it could be sort of contextualized back home in Malaysia. And I'm very much interested in sort of like object-based works and the tradition of craft. And I guess I make work thinking in that sense. That, so if I'm making a painting, it's very much informed by a idea of sort of sculpture or construction. While people might look at it, oh, it looks like a painting, but it's actually not because that's, I think, where I come from, from my training as well. Yeah. Okay, so sense. Have any, yeah, yeah, it is. <laughs> so from my knowledge, you seem to be involved with a lot of residency programs. Could you share with us how that actually affects your practice? Ah, I mean, I've been thinking a lot about it because of COVID as well, like since like, res I don't know, I, I'm sure residency programs are open, but I guess they're, a bit more rarer nowadays. Um, this, they're just less around. And I think it's nice to take a break. And I think the MFA program is almost felt like a residency program, like a very long one, um, because it's nice to sort of like get out of your sort of like comfort zone, like, and your sort of studio, and also being around sort of other practitioners and yeah, and different sort of locations as well really influence the way I look at things afterwards, like especially in Tehran, um, where, you know, being around, seeing these beautiful carpets, um, Iranian carpets, and, you know, like Islamic art was amazing experience, and this rich history, which is not accessible anywhere. Yeah. Yeah, fair yeah. enough. So <laughs> let's move on to the next question. Uh, okay, so being an artist that travels a lot and practices both in foreign soul and at home, what can you say is the main difference between art community in Malaysia or, uh, and elsewhere? And how do you negotiate with those different situations? Um, I think I haven't traveled that much though. I've been here in Oxford for a year <laughs> because of COVID. So, um, but I think um, the differences, I mean, there are many differences, and I think um, I'm very much interested in sort of like how ideas and sort of different sort of voices are being, you know, sort of played out and, you know, um, sort of interests of artists um, in Malaysia. Like I still follow, you know, Malaysian artists on Instagram or Facebook. Um, there are many differences. I think like larger cities, there are many sort of sub scenes you know like it's because it's so big there's no like one singular scene um and i think in malaysia since a lot smaller there's almost like a there are sort of there may maybe less sub scenes so there um but i mean it's also at a point where malaysia is still developing as an art scene and yeah voices are being you know like coming up and like yeah okay so mr happen the following to that would you recommend the young artists in Malaysia to go out to foreign countries and explore the potential there? Yeah, no, definitely. I think you know, like try going residencies so if you can study abroad or try and live elsewhere. I think it's nice to be out of your comfort zone and and sort of be in a place where you can also be an observer, where I think a nice time is that when you're abroad you can almost sort of lose in the background and just sort of observe and look where you don't need to be act active, so much active in the scene. And I guess you could learn a lot by just looking and sort of just, yeah, listening and looking at work and yeah. Okay, all right, Mr. Kevin, this is the last question okay. for this. Yeah, yeah, okay. So in a sentence, could you cohesively describe to us the over overarching meaning or inquiry to your body of work? Huh. I mean, I've been thinking a lot about it as well. And I think I've, it's hard to pin down by yourself, the artist making the work as like, oh, this is my overarching theme or, you know, and I think 
people will come out with that later on in as they look into your work in the future i mean if you're if your work is that worthy to be looked at um then i guess a curator or you know would look at it and read it but i don't know i think my interest always changes all the time and i think um i was like right now it's about i don't know it's pulling out the, uh, just basically just the kind of and how i can sort of explore that and find new meaning and its value because if it exists for so long in malaysia throughout history it must mean something that's what i've been thinking but yeah <laughs> i hope that helps yeah, yeah it is okay yeah. thank you mr happily for answering all those inquiries and sharing with us all the knowledge surely it has opened our eyes and give us peek into your practice from an angle we've never seen before once again thank you very much now you. i'd like to move us into the question and answer portion of our webinar so the floor is now open for our viewers to ask any question from it from as you have and we've already got a few questions lined up beforehand the first question from our webinar for our viewer is so what does it take to achieve your successes with so many solo exhibition and do you have any particular advice um i don't know if i think i'm successful <laughs> i think i just kind of do work and um i I'm, i don't know i think just the main advice would be just like be really passionate i mean i hate the idea of passion maybe have a bit of drive and be very involved in your work and yeah i think that's it like and try and find the value in what you're doing somehow you you think there is some value for society or whatever for the art scene or and sort of believe in that that your work will contribute to that yeah it's a very good advice for okay so the second question is who is your biggest inspiration and influence when it comes to art oh i don't know there's a lot but i think in malaysia i was always taken by i mean it's kind of cliche but i really love like latif muhyiddin's work especially when he sort of goes around after coming back from germany and around southeast asia uh, and sort of looking at sort of the architectural cultural elements of southeast asia and try to sort of fuse that in a visual language that is cross like it it goes across the countries in southeast asia like so the you know but it's there's a certain identity that we share among our neighbors and i find that really kind of inspiring and amazing um but i mean my work changes i like this iranian artist that's based in berlin now um nairi bahramain i think that's how you pronounce her name um but yeah okay <clears throat> so next question is do you have any interest in collaborating with any malaysian artists uh yeah always for sure um any even non-artists as well i would like to collaborate with architects um designers writers so yeah i mean cross-discipline collaborations will be amazing okay so next question is in your whole catalog do you have a favorite artwork um um no i think it's like sometimes it changes like i never have a favorite artwork it's kind of weird that like you cannot like i feel kind of bad if i like certain like i have a favorite um but i mean and works are works can be successful but not the artist so i feel like some works can be successful in some context but after a while it might lose us its meaning i don't know so I don't have a specific favorite artwork. Yeah. Okay, fair enough. Okay, so as you can see, COVID-19 in 2020. So how has the pan pandemic affected your practice and how have you adapted to the situation? Yeah, well, it's weird. I think since the pandemic started, I think there's a lot of talk about like this idea of slow time where you're sort of allowed to not do much um and i think i'm i i really sort of enjoy it like maybe over enjoyed it <laughs> during like the first lockdown in the uk um but 
I think it slowed down my practice for sure. It gave me time to sort of read more and just do other stuff more. But yeah, I mean, but slowly I think um, as things get better and, you know, I, I guess um, you can be kind of quote unquote like productive. But yeah, I mean, it's, I, I do other stuff like reading and like, yeah. Yeah, true. COVID nine COVID nineteen has limited everything. So yeah. okay, what should happen? The next question is: If you weren't an artist, where do you think you would stand today in some of occupation? If I'm not an artist, what would yeah. I be? I mean, I I mean, it's just I really don't know. I think I mean I would like to teach. I think I like te the idea of teaching. Um, so. I really respect the profession of teaching, so I think I would do that. Or, I mean, I would love, if I can write better, I would love to write as well. So, I think, yeah. Okay, yeah, since yeah. you already mentioned about teaching, so what subject would you teach? I mean, art, obviously, but um, I think any, any form of teaching is great, like English or Malay or, yeah, any, any form of teaching, of sort of knowledge, like you know giving it's great okay so if you're an art teacher and if you are producing an artwork would you still call yourself an artist huh <laughs> sounds like a test um yeah i mean i don't know it's um yeah i mean i think i do believe that art is not exclusively for artists that produce work for galleries you know so yeah the the, the term Okay, so next question is, what are your biggest challenges as an art as a Malaysian artist in foreign country? Ah, I think I mean there's a lot. I mean I've I've been speaking to some friends about it who are also um, Asian or Southeast Asian living living abroad and practicing and an artist. And I think being not pigeonholed is really difficult because I think opportunities come as well because you in a way self pigeonhole yourself for certain grants or exhibition opportunities and and i think being always sort of thought about oh the southeast asian artists in london you know where you're automatic automatically thought of as that and i think it's really difficult because hey i do study here and hey i do have friends in the local art scene and you know it's just it's really yeah, it's really hard to get out of that being pigeonhole and also pigeonholing yourself because that also helps for you to get visibility, I guess. But yeah, I guess that sort of double edged sword. Yeah. Yeah, pigeonhole in yourself is very interesting. Yeah. Okay, so <laughs> next question is um, you just recently graduated from Raskin School of Art, Oxford University. As you can see, Ruskin School is known as to be more theoretical than other art school. Can you share with us how you adapted with your practice after attending the Ruskin? Um, yeah, I mean, the thing is that I decided to stay in Oxford for another year and pick up a studio is because um, the course at the Ruskin is really short. And I thought if I spend another year sort of pushing forward and I have an exhibition schedule in a college in Oxford, in May, a solo show. So I thought I can sort of treat it as my second year uh, at the Ruskin, and I can still sort of do the research that I want, <coughs> and sort of develop the body of work that I started at the Ruskin. But at the Ruskin, it's really, I mean, there's a lot. It's sort of like, it introduces you to sort of different discourses and sort of focuses, thematic focuses, and that's right. Um, and you can sort of pursue that if you're interested and i think the most beneficial part of being at the ruskin is the the tutors so you get really great tutors um and i enjoyed talking to some of the tutors there and really they sort of like dissect your work and point out really obvious things that you don't see um yeah kind of problematic okay so next question is First of all, I would like to congratulate congratulate you, congratulations for winning the Ashmole and Vivian Late Prize this year. So, how do you feel when people appreciate your artwork? Um, 
I don't know. Um, I mean, <laughs> I'm really thankful, definitely. Uh, very happy. Um, yeah, I never expected expect anything, <laughs> but yeah, I just sort of do it. But yeah, no, it's, I'm really happy and thankful. Okay, so Mr. Happy, based on one of the slides, I noticed that there are some nostalgic memories in it. How do you come up with that? Did you use your imagination or did it come up with a research or sketches development? Um, I think it was more towards um, sort of the research around the kain, and I just there's like a plethora of sort of materials and then I, I was just interested in how it became like this character that exists in sort of Malaysian culture and life and a lot and I'm just sort of surprised that no one has actually <clears throat> really looked into it. Um, and yeah, and so it's it's more towards that, but also sort of my personal journey as an artist and, and growing up and stuff. Yeah, and always sort of tying it back to home. Okay, so next question is, what is your biggest challenge? that has become the source of your strength in pursuing and upward? Wow, I mean, oh, biggest challenge. It's all very big. <laughs> um, biggest challenge, I think, <clears throat> I don't know. I think this re developing this body of work has been my biggest challenge. And I think coming out of grad school like or an MFA program is really a big challenge. and. And, and working on a new type of work that you've, you've never done before. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a huge sort of like endeavor. And yeah, I guess that's it. Like working sort of differently and in, in, in a new way of making work and yeah. Okay, so next question. Do you have any memorable memories as an artist while studying in the UK? Um, I think I, as I think when I was doing my undergrad in London, I think the most memorable memory was sort of interning at a gallery um, in London, in Mayfair. Um, I was doing, I was working there like one to three days a week. Um, it's a contemporary art gallery and they represent artists that I really liked. Um, but <coughs> I think the memories of, that I really cherished were like installing artworks by artists like Nina Bayer or, um, Oscar Tuazon and it really like handling those works really felt because when you go to a gallery or museum you just sort of look at them on the wall or you can't really handle them and I think that was the first time where I would be able to handle the works and it felt like wow you can also make these works there's no it feels more you feel not so disconnected from it like and a foreigner in London looking at a, an artwork in a gallery once you sort of help install it and touch it like it feels wow you can also make it you know like you can also make a contemporary artwork yeah, yeah. okay um <laughs> next question is have you planned anything interesting for 2021 um well it's hard to plan <laughs> because of the pandemic um but uh, i don't know just like a few shows um if i can make the work definitely i want to show the um the Kain Peleka the Sarong works in a solo show, which I haven't done yet. So that would be one of the aims. All right. So Mr. Hafendi, we have more questions in the chat box. Let's see. Oh, wow. Wow, yes. <laughs> okay, so question from Adli. Does working overseas amplify your sense of nostalgia towards home? As it almost feels like your work has the same sense. Yeah, well, I mean, a little bit. I try, it's hard because I don't try and think of it as nostalgia because I look at, it was sort of more an objective way of looking at the kind of like throughout time, um, even contemporary time. And, but I guess, you know, when you sort of work with certain sort of images or type of imagery, it does sort of play a part. Um, yeah, I never thought about it that way. Um, yeah. Okay. Okay, so another question from Facebook from Miss Shafika. How do you na navigate the art world? I, art world? Yeah. Um, I don't know. <laughs> I just sort of, <laughs> I mean, yeah. I, 
it's really hard there's many art worlds as well there's no like singular art world um yeah true it's very think, general yeah it's very yeah so i think it's also like once you find people that believe in your work and i think make like be good really good friends with them um they are you know people from all over the world that are interested in art from malaysia and from southeast asia and i think you just make sure you make interesting work and yeah and be nice to them i guess yeah. okay so another question from facebook this one is from Encik farid raihan are you more into three-dimensional art rather than two dimension yeah well in, that's um i've been thinking a lot about that as well and i think i mean <clears throat> i find it kind of problematic when someone say that i'm trying to make paintings which i'm not and i think it's easier to think about them as sort of constructions and i've always been making constructions which are painted um but i think i would definitely am more comfortable with making like three-dimensional work um materially sort of um, sensitive to three-dimensional three work than sort of painting because i find painting really i mean I, yeah it's difficult yeah. true okay so next question is from miss aisha what are your hopes or goals in the art industry maybe in five to ten years from now um i don't know i i like try to be an artist so keep making better work and do shows i think yeah <laughs> Okay. And so to do more shows in Malaysia as well. So, um, looking forward to that. No, yeah, thank you. Okay, so next question is also from Farid Rai. Eh, no, no, sorry. Oh, yeah. From Ain Aina. So, were you encouraged to do or study art from your childhood? Childhood. Uh, yeah, I think my parents were very encouraging. Um, they sent me to art classes at MIA when I was like eight, I think. And then, <coughs> and yeah, San Sani when I was like 15. But yeah, I've always been taking art classes and stuff. And growing up, my parents have been like taking me to museums and stuff when we were overseas. So it's been, yeah, they've been very encouraging. Okay, I think that was the last question. All wow. right, so <laughs> thank you so much, Mr. Heavenly, for sharing your, sharing your knowledge and all the insight on your art practices. We are definitely so blessed to have had grace your time with us. We hope we could make more inquiries, but unfortunately, the time is not on our side. Thus, we would like to thank you again for joining us. We are also happy to share with you that our team have collectively, collectively made something special as a token of appreciation. We will personally deliver it to you sometime soon. All right, um, we have sent the link for the attendance in the Google Classroom. All students may fill up your name and student ID. And all the participants watching, we would like to thank you again for joining us. And finally, on behalf of my team, stay healthy, be safe, till next time. Bye.